Hi, and welcome to Parkinson TV, an educational series that brings you diverse perspectives of Parkinson disease and its many possible symptoms. Season one focused on the basics of living with Parkinson's. In season two, we're exploring an important topic that's not discussed often enough, mental health. In our first episode of season two, we talked about depression and anxiety. In our second episode, we'll discuss psychosis, a less common but potentially very severe symptom of Parkinson's. Joining us today is series creator and neurologist, Dr. Boz Bloom from the Netherlands. Thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We're also delighted to introduce our guests, Dr. Allison Willis and Carol Vizzini. Allison is an assistant professor of neurology and epidemiology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Allison, we're so glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here as well. Thank you. Carol has Parkinson's, and she's experienced forms of psychosis in addition to anxiety. Carol, we are looking so forward to hearing your story today. Thank you. I'm here. Glad to hear, be here and uh, talk about it. Boss, let's start with the big picture. There are so many things going on today with Parkinson's. What specifically can we talk about when it comes to psychosis? Do we know a cause? Um, well, first of all, what are we talking about? I always separate psychosis from hallucinations. Hallucinations is typically seeing things, sometimes hearing things that other people don't see or hear, but where the patient thinks they're real, but there is at least some form of insight retained. In a psychosis, things get a little bit worse and the insight is gone. And you can imagine how this can be very scary. Um, sometimes these psychoses can bring back um, and memories from, uh, from the past uh, in a very lively fashion, and it can be very scary for patients. Um, if you think about the cause, um, there's a number of things you need to think about. One is the disease itself. We increasingly realize that a hallucination or a psychosis is a sign of more advanced, long-standing disease. Medication can definitely play a role. Dopaminergic medication can make things worse, and some pills are worse than others, and we can talk about that later. Um, and thirdly, whenever a patient develops hallucinations or a psychosis, I always check out on the general medical condition because a bladder infection, just a simple thing, can trigger a cascade of events that also manifest itself as a psychosis. Carol, can you tell us what you have experienced? I've experienced two, well, I guess I've had three experiences, but... Um, the first one, I didn't even recognize it as anything. You told me when we spoke that you saw things? Yes, but they were things that, that were there in the living room. I have a rug that's pretty densely populated with flowers. And, and, I, and, um, and these creatures on the, on the pillows changed um, from being um, beautiful and, and normal into something that was a little bit more malevolent. Alison, is this common? I mean, obviously people wouldn't think that they would have something like psychosis. People with Parkinson's disease are especially vulnerable to psychosis. So just as Boss mentioned, uh, you can have psychosis as a manifestation of later disease, or commonly, you can have psychosis as a symptom, sometimes your only symptom, of an infection, of an imbalance in the, your blood chemistries. It can be a symptom of a, another medical condition. And uh, when we think about psychosis for Parkinson's disease patients, we always first think about whether there's an underlying factor that's precipitating it, especially if the person doesn't have advanced disease. The patients that you see, what, what do you see most often? Is there a common thread with the type of psychosis? Well, I, 
in general, people that we identify as having psychosis have hallucinations. They see things that aren't there or uh, things that they see appear different. As you mentioned, your beautiful flowered carpeting looked different. They may hear noises that, aren't, uh, that no one else can hear or hear people whispering to them. Sometimes people can have thoughts that are frightening, such as paranoia or thinking someone is coming in their house or someone is trying to hurt them. All of those symptoms can fall under psychosis for Parkinson's disease patients. And what should people do if they're experiencing the symptoms? Um, well, if you say, what should people do? It's families, um, because the insight is not always retained and it, it's scary and it's maybe not always something patients always report. Um, so the spouse and other family members should be very um, alert to this and report it to the physician. Because as Alison said, you know, you want to search for an underlying treatable condition. Um, and if there is an infection, if there is an imbalance in your blood chemistry, oftentimes that can be treated. Sometimes you need to tweak the medication or start new medications to suppress the psychosis. So uh, it's a treatable condition. Um, I'm not saying it's always treatable and I'm not saying it's easy, but certainly there are things that can and should be done. Carol, what, what was done in your case? Did you talk about it? Did you ask for help? I, I talked to my neurologist and also to um, a psychiatrist who works closely with that neurologist. And I don't think they th saw anything particularly worrisome. So you didn't have something to that we could keep get an eye on. kind of treatment or anything? Yes. In addition, um, Allison, to what Boss said, what other things work for treatment? If you like, can identify, you know, I, I, if it isn't a medical, you know, an, an infection or something like that. I ask myself, does this patient have the right support system right now to get them through the eval assessment and evaluation process for psychosis? As Boss mentioned, it can be frightening to experience psychotic symptoms, and a patient may be afraid to share with their doctor, with their family member, that they are seeing things that are uh, frightening or seem out of the ordinary. Then, as Boss mentioned and I mentioned, we look for reversible causes. We look for reversible causes in um, using blood tests or x-rays if indicated. We always review medications. There are many medications that can trigger psychosis. If we don't find a reversible cause, there are several medications that are available that can treat the symptoms of psychosis. And we generally will uh, discuss with a patient the risks and benefits of using one of those medications uh, and then decide together on a course of treatment. We also had a chance recently to speak with Robert Sanders. He also has Parkinson's. We talked to him about his experiences and what he does to cope with his psychosis. Let's take a look. Daily walks with his dog, Blue, help Robert Sanders clear his head. The fresh air helps. It does, it really does. I like to be outside. I can't wait for the weather to get better so I can be outside more and sit on my deck. Robert was diagnosed with Parkinson's five years ago after noticing a tremor in his arm. His symptoms are both physical and mental. So I think most people don't really know exactly what Parkinson's is and how it affects people. It's a lot, it's a lot deeper than just like having a tremor. He also suffers from psychosis. But I have had some strange hallucinations, I guess you would call them. Um, there's a man that lives in my mirror in my bedroom. I see him every once in a while, he's kind of creepy. Robert says at night, he sometimes sees aliens in his backyard. These little creatures running around at night in my backyard, and they were just kind of nondescript. I can't really describe them to you, but they were aliens. Well, I took the dog out, I was standing in the dock, and I could see them running around in the, in, in the bushes out there. It was late at night. He says these delusions usually happen at night when he's tired. I don't really know. It comes and goes, though. I haven't had, had an episode for quite a while now, but it could happen at any time. 
So I don't really know what causes it. I don't know what controls it. This psychosis doesn't scare Robert because he knows it isn't real. New medicines are helping him sleep better at night, and that means fewer psychotic episodes. I would just say you have to keep your mind open and, and realize that it's not reality. That it's not really going to affect you. I mean, it's not going to hurt you at all. It's just there. And sometimes you see things that you, you, know, you don't want to see, but you can't help it. So let's talk about Robert's experience. In what ways are his symptoms typical of someone with Parkinson's and psychosis, Allison? Robert's experiences of seeing someone who wasn't there, thinking that someone was trying to hurt him, seeing things in the mirror, those are typical for visual hallucinations and paranoia that we can see with patients who have Parkinson's and psychosis. You can also have changes in behavior, agitation, and fearfulness, which usually results from internal paranoia that the person isn't able to express. How would you treat somebody like, like Rob? I know you haven't met him, but mm -hmm. seeing that his symptoms are at a certain level. If we've identified reversible causes, we address those. If we are unable to identify reversible causes and the person is experiencing harmful, frightening uh, hallucinations like Robert, it would lead us to consider more strongly starting a medication for the psychosis as opposed to um, continuing to watch them or monitor. And Carol, I know that you haven't had to get any treatment. Right. How do you work this out? I mean, how do you deal with this? I think there are things that we all experience that maybe isn't real, real, like the fruit on the, in the basket. Can you talk to somebody about it? Is it something you can discuss with somebody else? Or you keep it to yourself? Um, so far, I've kept it by myself. I, mean, I think I have a lot of friends. <laughs> well, and I know you have a great caregiver yeah. and uh, who's also a, with you today and a good support system. That is so important. How oh, yes. does she help? You can talk to her probably about anything. Yes, I think she's my best friend. It feels much better if, if something is shared with someone else. So I think for caregivers, it's important to know that one of the ways you can support your loved one through this experience is to ask. Don't rely on them to share. They may feel uncomfortable sharing, even when you are close, to ask about the things that they're seeing or thinking so you can have an understanding of whether hallucinations are worsening. And it may be time to consider a treatment. Just a little bit more about the treatment. Um, of course, we totally agree on the treatment. In the old days, it's maybe important to emphasize, we tended to withdraw dopaminergic medication because we know that pushing the dopaminergic system hard is another way of inducing a psychosis. We also know that the disease itself is largely responsible. And if you reduce the medication, psychosis may get a little bit better, but patients pay a price by more stiffness, more slowness, more motor problems. So that's why in general, if you can reduce any medication that's likely to be responsible and likely to be very small effect on Parkinson's, like amantadine is a drug that is likely to induce or worsen the hallucinations, um, but not likely to have a huge effect on your Parkinson's, you'd withdraw it. But otherwise, mainstay treatments like levodopa, I tend to keep them intact and then resort to specific treatments to suppress the um, psychosis. I will add that I... Uh, it is, not, it is rare that I find a patient who has psychosis who doesn't have another medication for another medical condition on their medication list that is capable of inducing psychosis or tipping someone over the edge if they're close to psychosis. So you really have to think about all of your medications, not just your Parkinson's disease I was just going to say, you're referring to other things that you might be taking. Correct allergy medications, bladder medications, cardiac medications. There are many, many medications that can push someone over the threshold for psychosis. Carol, 
have you changed anything about your medications or talked to the doctor because of these, or it hasn't been enough to really make a change? Well, I've been on some kind of medication for about three years, I think. And, um, yeah, it's, it's gone through changes. You know, let's tweak it here, let's tweak it there. My doctors know all of my medications I'm taking. And so important, isn't it? Yes, it's extremely important. And the other thing we've talked about a little bit is exercise, staying busy. Do you find that helps you at all? Yes, I think so. Um, first of all, if you're keeping yourself strong, doing some maybe yoga mm -hmm. is, is very good, I think, for uh, maintaining a good sense of balance. Does it help you in terms of um, your level of activity and your, the way you feel, too? Yes, I feel, um, I think, much happier because instead of going down, 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 I'm, I'm coming up. New in season two, we're debuting a caregiver perspective segment. We interview people from around the country who are caring for someone with Parkinson's. For this episode, we're joined remotely by Nancy Koning. Nancy, thanks for being here with us from Delaware. Thank you for having me. From your experience, what are the biggest challenges that those with Parkinson's and psychosis, as well as their caregivers, face on a daily basis? Well, the biggest thing that I noticed, of course, I can't speak for my husband, but the things that I noticed was that his behavior was very erratic. He would be fine with eye-to-eye -eye contact, left to his own devices, he would get bored easily. He had cut down trees, um, thinking that he was saving me from having the, the tree pruners come in. Uh, he was climbing ladders to repaint what painters had already done on the house. Um, he was arguing with neighbors who were not argumentative. He um, would get ideas in his head that he had to do certain things and there was no rationale for, nor could he explain why he was doing the things other than he felt like he had to. Um, the end came for him being on the loose and being able to do things for himself when he decided he wanted a cheesesteak and went two states away to get it. He uh, got two buses, then hopped a train, went to Philadelphia, had his cheesesteak, and probably forgot how to get home. He's in a nursing home now, needless to say, for his own safety and for everyone else's. Does your loved one have any of the symptoms that are unusual or especially noteworthy? Well, I don't know too much about what typical symptoms are, but at, at one point when he reached the nursing home, he's in a veteran's nursing home and he is a vet, he's a, a past officer. Um, they had um, the honor guard. And when anyone passed away, Tom was the head of the honor guard. So whether it was day or night, he would get up. And then he started to envision the angel of death on his closet door. And um, that was always the precursor of somebody going to die. So that was the most unusual thing that, that we encountered. Can you offer any thoughts and advice for our viewers about caring for someone with Parkinson's and psychosis, and also share your hope for the future? Well, my best advice is to keep a sense of humor. Sit back and don't get too agitated. I mean, that's hard to do. Find things to keep yourself occupied outside of the illness. Um, make sure that you maintain contacts with friends. Join support groups. I've started support groups so that I would have people that were in the same boat, or I always look for people that were farther down the line so that I could see what was coming ahead and be a little bit prepared for what I might find down the road. And what I found was the hardest for me was um, deciding that I needed to make the break, that he needed to be in a nursing home for his own safety, and that for my sanity, he needed to be there as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Nancy Koning. Nancy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here. Thinking about hope for the future, let's have a look forward, Boz. What is the prognosis for people who suffer from psychosis? Well, first of all, it's critical to get good treatment. Uh, we know that um, during a psychotic episode, patients may start to wander about. Uh, these events typically happen in the evening or at night. 
people may sustain a fall while they're psychotic and even fracture a bone or have some other type of injury. So treatment is critical. In terms of general prognosis, it really depends on the underlying cause. If it's a simple change in medication, and Alison keeps hammering on reviewing medication, reviewing medication, it's, it's key. If it's simply reducing the medication, taking away culprit drugs, then your prognosis is fine. If it's an underlying infection or a metabolic disorder and you can treat it, prognosis is fine. We have to be fair and honest. If it's the disease itself, we know that a psychosis in that case is a sign of a more advanced disease. And people will notice that not only the psychosis is there, it tends to coincide with more difficult gait and balance. And it's a time when Parkinson's becomes a little bit more problematic. Having said that, uh, it is treatable and I'm not the type of person to ever give up. So yes, it is a more complicated phase, but even then, there's a lot we can do to help people and their families. And Alison, I know there are some adverse treatments. Could you talk a little bit about that? Some medications are riskier than others in treating psychosis and Parkinson's because they can make the symptoms of Parkinson's worse. In general, neurologists and doctors familiar with treating Parkinson's disease patients avoid those medications. Where that can be problematic is if you find yourself in an emergency situation or in the emergency room where you are unable to give a lot of health information and you could be exposed to an antipsychotic that can worsen your Parkinsonism. One uh, classic medication that does this is called haloperidol. And it is often given for psychosis in emergency situations in the hospital. And for Parkinson's disease patients, it can make their Parkinson's symptoms much worse in the short term. As the medication wears off, you will have recovery, but it can make uh, for a very uncomfortable couple of days. The other problem I see is general undertreatment. So yes, you know, antipsychotics can make Parkinson's symptoms sometimes worse. But the other side of the coin is that there is a large group of patients undertreated for their psychosis. And I see lots of doctors too scary or just reducing dopaminergic medication instead of resorting to an antipsychotic, which can be effective. So undertreatment is another issue. Carol, I know you're hearing all about medications and what has helped you the most, would you say, of any of, you, of your treatments? I think it was a better day for me when, when Ritary came around. And I think it's important when you have, when you are in a, in a group that, uh, in, let's say an exercise class, um, you know, talk about, mm -hmm. I mean, you're all there because you have Parkinson's. And so there's your chance to, to talk. What has been the hardest part for you throughout your experience? Realizing that I was gonna have to, or I thought, I was going to have to give up playing the cello, mm. a professional musician. Do you still Are play? You, yeah, yeah, I was going to say this. Are you still playing? I just made a decision about three weeks ago to start playing again. Good. Oh, wow. Good for you. Good for you. After a year. Yeah. So you're feeling better then? Yes, I think I am. That's great. I'm a strong believer in the beneficial effects of music, dance, art, creativity. And I'm always amazed by what patients do and how they perform. So good for you for starting again. For each episode, we ask our viewers beforehand what questions they have about this topic. I have Parkinson's and I suffer from visual hallucinations. Is it normal? Boz? No, it's not normal. Um, it's a part of the disease, as we said. So for one reason we don't fully understand is visual hallucinations, seeing things is more common than, for example, hearing things or thinking things. Um, one thing that we didn't address yet is sometimes eye problems, poor eyesight, can lead to what people think is visual hallucinations, but it's actually a problem in the eyes and not in the brain. So it's always good to have your eyes checked out when you have visual hallucinations. How important is it for people to be willing to take part in research and clinical trials? I'm gonna ask you, Carol. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what would we do without that? I mean, this is how we learn. Have you done this? Yes. Tell us about that. It's been very successful for you. Yes, I learned about it about several techniques for 
depression and... We want to get Parkinson's off the planet. Um, and while we're waiting for that, get better treatments. We need research for that. And we researchers and clinicians can only do it together with patients like Carol. The only way to treat this disease is to do it together. Trials are critical. And I know we are oftentimes asking a lot of our patients, um, but it's critical. And for example, a, an initiative like Fox Insight by the Michael J. Fox Foundation is a wonderful way for patients to try and find a trial that suits their own interests. It's sort of a matchmaking place where trialists can find patients and the other way around. Great. How far off is a cure? You just talked about that. That's got to be one of the, the biggest questions you're asked, too. When are you going to find a cure? I mean, are we looking at years? Step number one is better treatment today. And I think that's within reach. It gets better already day by day. It needs to get better. Second one is hopefully maybe slowing down the progression of the disease. And there's some interesting work in that area. The next thing is maybe stopping the disease from progressing even further. And then prevention or a, a cure, I think, is not within close reach. It may take 10, 20, 30 years. I don't know. I don't want to make any false promises. What I want to tell all the people watching this program, Parkinson's today is not the same as Parkinson's 10 years ago. And I predict Parkinson's 10 years from now will again be different, and it will be a better world. Any final thoughts, Allison? Well, I think it's very important to communicate with your doctor, to uh, be open about the symptoms that you're having, and to be encouraged that Parkinson's disease research of all types, including drug trials and clinical trials that help you understand how to live better with Parkinson's, are all coming together to improve your day-to-day -day life. And Carol, your hope for the future. Well, my hope is that that, um, that there would be, be better treatments while we're looking for a cure. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of Parkinson TV on Psychosis. We want to thank our panelists, Boz, Allison, and Carol, for sharing their knowledge and experience with all of our viewers. Thanks so much for joining us today. We also would love to thank Robert, and Nancy for sharing their stories and perspectives. To close, we're going to hear an overview of the whole episode in 60 seconds from Boz in an all new Parkinson Minute. Another hugely important topic today on Parkinson's disease, psychosis in Parkinson's disease, and not the easiest one. Not the easiest one because it's complex and it's debilitating. We talked about the various presentations. We separated hallucinations, where some form of insight is retained from an outright psychosis, where things are totally real for patients. We talked about the fact that it is always critical to review the medication and to remove culprit medication. This can be Parkinson's medication, but oftentimes it can be other medication. We talked about the importance of doing a general workup, looking for maybe a bladder infection, a metabolic disorder, um, any other blood chemistry disorders, which is treatable. And if that's all not the case, then it could be the Parkinson's disease itself, which we can know can cause hallucinations or psychosis. In that case, the reflex should probably not be to reduce the dopaminergic medication because it may worsen the Parkinson's symptoms, but rather to resort to symptomatic treatments to make things better. If it's mild, if it's hallucinations, could be a cholinesterase inhibitor, if it's a more severe psychosis, then antipsychotics can be a serious consideration. You always need to find the right dose for the right person um, and the right symptom. And in doing so, even a psychosis can be improved with the right management.